Thank you, everyone, for attending. It's it's Friday of Mises U, so you are you're almost at the finish line. Uh, I do apologize; I haven't been here for the past couple days. I was at Freedom Fest in South Dakota, defending Murray Rothbard's interpretation of the Constitution, found and conceived in Liberty Volume Five. Uh, so I, I have returned, and uh, I guess. I know everyone's been been listening to the other uh, professors and the, the various lectures. I think now the the more advanced learning can begin now that I'm back. So I would <laughs> like everyone to forget everything that they've heard since about 4:45 on Monday, and then I think we can uh, we'll, we'll all be good. Uh, no, so anyway, uh, I'm very honored to be speaking about this uh, topic today. Uh, the Title of my presentation, as you can all see, is Cronyism, Liberty Versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849. Uh, what is the uh, talk about? Well, this is on my forthcoming book <clears throat> that's coming out. The Mises Institute is publishing it. It will be released uh, this October, uh, tentatively at the Supporter Summit, uh, which I'm very excited about. This is a project. Uh, Hunter Lewis uh, asked me to write a book on the uh, history of crony capitalism in America a couple of years ago. And uh, I'm happy to say that at least one phase of the project uh, is complete. So uh, <clears throat> what is cronyism? So traditionally, when we hear about why the government passed a law, uh, we always are told the public interest uh, view. So the government passed a law to uh, promote the public welfare, to protect jobs, to increase production, to uh, reduce inequality, et cetera, et cetera. So why the government supports protective tariffs? Well, that's to uh, protect American jobs, right? Uh, the actual reason for laws as, as, as Austrian economists and libertarians, as we know, is, is, is quite different, right? There's a special interest reason. Uh, there's a, a crony reason. Uh, so cronyism is, is, <clears throat> is when the government passes laws uh, that to, pr to promote the interests of, uh, of uh, select groups, what we call special interests, at the public's expense. So we know the government doesn't push for protective tariffs to uh, protect jobs, but it's really to privilege uh, one uh, industry at the expense of consumers who are forced to pay higher prices, right? And we can see this with other laws uh, <clears throat> continuing uh, the story. It's really uh, the, the, the actual stated reason, the, the, the stated reason is always the public interest, but that's really just a thin veneer, kind of a cloak uh, behind the actual reason, right? In order to understand, in order to figure out the actual reason, we have to be historians, right? We have to be detectives uh, looking uh, beneath the surface to try and see who are the relevant interests uh, lobbying for the law, okay? What were their, uh, the, the rewards they were trying to get? Did they actually get those rewards, uh, et cetera, okay? This is what I try and do in my book, right? I concentrate on the early America, uh, 1607 to 1849, Murray Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty uh, takes place from 1607, which is the founding of Jamestown, uh, the colony in Virginia, uh, to about 1789, which was the beginning of the George Washington presidency. He technically goes to 1791, uh, covers the Bill of Rights, really just the, in, in, from those two years. Uh, I cover uh, that period, sort of summarize the cronyism uh, in those years, and then I extensively cover the period after. Right from the George Washington presidency, 1789, to the end of the Mexican War, uh, which was 1848, uh, so going on to 1849. Um, so it's kind of a sequel almost, or, or it, it, it's not really it's a sequel. It's like a, a continuing the, the the story that Rothbard describes uh, in Conceived in Liberty. Uh, and I was I was very happy we uh, the, with the cover we have a like an old fashioned. Uh, you know, uh, robber baron, you could say, and he's sort of lording over America, because that's what I'm trying to do in this book, looking at who were these people. And of course, they got money on their mind, uh, so to speak. So anyway, okay, what is the thesis? All right, what am I what am I actually getting at? Am I just sort of rambling on? Uh, so cronyism, I argue in, my, in my, my narrative that cronyism increased in a jagged fashion. It wasn't just a linear increase where special interest policies just increased uh, sort of in an automatic fashion each year at a constant rate. It went up, then it declined a little bit, then it went up, then it declined a little bit, then it went up. Okay, so it's sort of a, a staggered increase, right? And why did it do this? Why did special interest policies, uh, uh, you know, proceed in this fashion? Well, I explain this uh, 
through the liberty versus power theory. Okay, the liberty versus power theory is best articulated by Murray Rothbard and conceived in liberty, animated a, a large part of his historical analysis. It originally came from Lord Acton, who's a very prominent uh, late 19th century uh, libertarian historian. So what, what are the three main uh, components of this theory? Well, the first component is that history is a clash between the forces of liberty and the forces of power. So you've got the forces of liberty, uh, those groups promoting small government, anti-cronyism, right? They want to get rid of special interest privileges, so they are supporting hard money. Uh, they're supporting free trade, uh, no public subsidies, uh, et cetera. Um, then you have the forces of power, the forces of big government. They're supporting crony policies, right? They want uh, central banking. They want protective tariffs. They want... Uh, government land grants and monetary aid to favored businesses, so on and so forth, right? So when the forces of liberty control the government, they're able to remove special interest privileges. When the forces of power control the government, they're able to increase uh, their special interest uh, privileges, okay? Uh, but the complexity or sort of the, the interesting aspect of the theory comes in the second two components. And the second component is that power corrupts, Right. I define corruption as an increased tendency to cronyism. So this comes from a very famous uh, phrase by Lord Acton, probably his most famous statement, is that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay. So what happens is when the forces of liberty take control of the government, they say, well, we want to get rid of all this cronyism. We're going to enact all these policies. It, <clears throat> you know, We're going to get rid of all this stuff. It's going to be great. But when they're in control of the government, they get corrupted by it. Okay, so then they say, well, we, we need to look out for the next election. Okay, so we need to appeal to these constituents. So we don't want to get rid of, of this policy, at least so fast, maybe gradually, or, you know, we, we reduce something else. Or then they say, well, we need to appeal to this group. So we need to actually give them favors, et cetera. So they, they're able to reduce cronyism a little bit. But as time goes on, they start to increase their own cronyism. And this is a something... Uh, as, as libertarians, we can kind of see happens even in our own, uh, the, you know, the, the, the modern world. That's why we cynically look at politics. A reform group says they're going to change something, and then they don't change anything, right? And then the last component is that, well, reform is difficult precisely because power corrupts. So this is why it's so difficult to actually reform the government. Because in order to reform the government to reduce cronyism, uh, you have to take control of the agency that is going to incentivize people to do to uh, <clears throat> pursue their own cronyism. Okay, so really the, uh, the the best policies that can achieve reform are ones that you're actually sort of trying to break away from the government, some sort of nullification or secession. Because if you're trying to work through the government, uh, given enough time, you're you're going to get corrupted by by uh, the con the control that comes with uh, running the government. Okay. So in American history, in the time period I analyze, the proximate driver of cronyism was the desire to build an American empire. Okay? This is a word that was used repeatedly uh, by the founding fathers as well as uh, later American politicians, the empire, this territorial, vast, and influential co uh, country. <clears throat> so the forces of power, they wanted to uh, pursue an empire of power, sort of like the old orders of Europe. Right, so it would be able to this large and powerful uh, government with a strong military. It would pursue all sorts of mercantilist policies. It would have colonies around the world. It would be able to fight Britain and France, etc. Where the forces of liberty wanted to pursue what Thomas Jefferson called an empire of liberty. So this was a a, a country that was really decentralized, or it actually be multiple countries or confederations, and it was just linked together through the common. Uh, cultural norms in constitutions. Okay, so Thomas Jefferson, for example, he thought the West Coast would be its own country, something that I hope, <laughs> you know, because it's still possible, right? Uh, many others, they thought that there would be separate uh, confederacies throughout the United States. It wasn't just sort of preordained that we have the <clears throat> continental United States stretching from the East Coast to the West Coast. Okay. Whereas the forces of power wanted not only the continental United States, but also uh, much more, particularly Canada and Mexico uh, and Cuba and so on. So anyway, uh, for the rest of the talk, I would like to uh, go through my uh, the book, provide sort of a brief summary. 
So this is sort of a an interesting tension where I if, if I if I do too good of a job, then no one's going to want to buy the book when it comes out. But if I do too mediocre of a job, then no one's going to want to buy the book. So I basically have to do I have to I have to straddle the line between the good and bad, and I think I'm I'm expertly suited for this task. So <laughs> I, I hope I hope you'll be able to last uh, for the next uh, 40, 40 minutes or so. But anyway. We go to the first part. Uh, this is the Road to Empire, 1607 to 1790. Okay, so this is kind of covering the material of uh, Rothbard's Conceived in Liberty, uh, or at least the, the time period, uh, with some extra stuff at the end, which I'll, which I'll talk about. So we start off with the first chapter, chapter one, The Path to American Independence. Okay. The United States, or the American colonies, were not conceived in liberty, so to speak. As Rothbard explains, they were, they were actually the desire of, or the, the product of the old orders of Europe. So the forces in favor of mercantilism, special interest privileges, feudalism, uh, land, uh, land grants, tying subjects to the land, and absolutism, uh, that the king, the government is divine. They wanted to extend their control from Europe to uh, North America. So the colonies, particularly the English colonies, were really just originally dumping grounds for uh, England's surplus poor. All these people thrown out of work from all the mercantilist policies, they said, all right, we'll just you know, send you over there. You can provide us raw materials to benefit our manufacturing industries and et cetera. Uh, fortunately, <clears throat> England never actually enforced their various mercantilist laws uh, in the United States, particularly the so-called Navigation Acts, which restricted and regulated uh, uh, American shipping and American production for the benefit of England, okay? This was because there was just so much land in America that people could just ignore the, the local rulers and just move west. England was preoccupied with foreign wars and internal strife. And whenever they did actually enforce the, 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 the laws, uh, the, the, the public revol revolted. Okay, so there were various rebellions. It was tax rebellions and all, all, all this great stuff over, over what we would consider relatively small levels of taxation. But that just makes it, in my opinion, all, all the more heroic uh, when people are getting out the pitchforks for uh, you know, minor, minor increases in taxes. So a policy that was known as salutary neglect uh, by the British government was practiced by the early to mid-1700s, which is basically, okay, we're just going to let them do their thing and if we let them do their thing, if we practice laissez-faire or we don't actually enforce the laws on the books, then they're going to grow prosperous and that's going to benefit us. Okay, This is the policy of, of various British officials um, at, the, uh, at the central government in Great Britain. Okay, But what happened is in the mid-1700s, uh, the 1750s, there was, there was a war, the French and Indian War, where Great Britain basically drove out uh, the French from North America. So Great Britain became the undisputed superpower. Uh, it had all the land, it had all the, all the industry, et cetera, uh, in North America. And then they said, all right, finally, we're going to be able to regulate the colonists. This is their grand design, so to speak. So they said, we're now going to raise taxes uh, so they'll be able to finance the standing army here. We're going to give out land grants to our favorite supporters in Great Britain. We're going to enforce the Navigation Acts, et cetera, okay? Well, the colonists were very upset about this. They weren't going to stand for these crony uh, laws. They, 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 were very, they were very upset. Uh, and so they increasingly uh, resisted. They, they nullified the laws. They refused to uh, enforce them, et cetera. And you had various prominent American revolutionaries, one of my favorite, Patrick Henry. Okay? And it's not just because we have the same great uh, you know, first name. Uh, we, you know, we we have we, we share many thoughts. Patrick Henry, uh, Virginia, was one of the leading uh, radicals, and he and he he was pushing for the the drastic uh, uh, um, option of basically secession. So you know, he has this great quote. He sees he's a, he's a great orator. He was one of the best. Uh, and he, you know, he's, he says he says, let it come. He says, I repeat, let it come. He says, is life so precious or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? He says, forbid it, almighty God. I care not what course others may take, but as for me, he's right there. He says, give me liberty or give me death, right? And this was, it, it, you know, it radicalized all the colonists. This was in March of 1775. And they said, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to support you. Re revolution is imminent. And we, we, we did revolt, particularly starting in Massachusetts. And the American Revolution was really a secession. 
should be called the American Secessionary War or something. It wasn't, we're not trying to control the government in Great Britain. Uh, we were really just trying to break away. This brings us to chapter two, where I talk about the American Revolutionary War. I say it's a great triumph of liberty. Uh, we, we secede. This was seen in uh, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Okay, we, we break away. This is the desire of the American revolutionaries who want to actually break away from uh, the old orders of Europe in order to create an empire of liberty uh, in North America. Unfortunately, there's also a group of American patriots who want to break away to form their own government, but they want to create an empire of power. Okay, this is particularly uh, many merchants uh, and landed oligarchs, uh, such as Robert Morris, uh, the famous merchant prince of Philadelphia. Okay. And they just want to create an American old order empire. Right? So what they do is after the Declaration of Independence, they try and push for a strong central government that will centralize the 13 independent states right? that were sort of informally or, uh, organizing in the uh, Continental Congress. Okay. And this is the Articles of Confederation. Okay. It originally was supposed to be much stronger, Right? But fortunately, the American radicals, uh, they, 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 the forces of liberty, they, they weaken it. So it's still a central government. It's still an increase in cronyism, uh, but uh, it's, it's weak. Particularly, uh, it doesn't have the power to tax. Right? Can you imagine that? A government, it has to ask the state governments for money. Right? It can't actually, in order to get this power to tax, it has to uh, pass an amendment where the state legislatures unanimously ratify it. Wouldn't that be great? We live in a government where if they want to tax us, all the state legislators have to, you know, ratify it. You know, we can only dream of, 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 such, a, <laughs> of, of such a world. But this is enough for Robert Morris and his, uh, and, and his cadre, all right, particularly uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, and James Madison. So Robert Morris, one of the first things he does in this new government where he has made uh, basically the, the treasurer is he pushes for a central bank, the Bank of North America. Okay, so he's got, we, we have a central bank, we have a crony central bank who was supposed to lend money to select businesses and the, uh, and, and the United States government, right? And he also pushes for a 5% tariff, all right, to raise money to pay off the enormous war debt Morris was pushing for. That, bear in mind, was no longer in the hands of the soldiers, it was in the hands of speculators who bought it very cheaply. So they were looking for a government to raise money so they could uh, basically pay out the speculators uh, at par. Okay. So all these crony privileges were going to be enacted in the early 1780s. Right? But the issue was Rhode Island held out. Rhode Island refused to ratify the tariff, and then Virginia reneged on its agreement, so the whole thing collapsed. Okay. So Robert Morris left the government in disgust. Uh, the Articles of Confederation got no taxing power. The Bank of North America eventually lost its privileges from the uh, central, uh, central government. So it seemed like the forces of liberty won, right? And it did. We did, right? Uh, the American Revolution led to many uh, positive benefits. Okay. Unfortunately, it also led to the Constitution, which was the topic, uh, was the subject of my talk uh, at uh, Freedom Fest, which... Uh, I described taking from Murray Rothbard should really be considered a triumph of power, okay? Because various special interest groups started to coalesce under Robert Morris and his group, the so-called nationalists who wanted a strong national government, debt holders, bankers, manufacturers and shippers, transportation companies, land speculators and merchants, military officials. They all wanted a stronger central government that could tax the public, protect their industries, grant their industries special favors, uh, dole out government contracts, uh, raise a powerful army to, uh, to, 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 uh, to conquer new territory, etc. Okay, So they all start, start to support the drive for a new, stronger central government. So you've got uh, nationalists, all right, uh, who cleverly call themselves federalists. Right. So federalism really means a balance of power between the states and the central government. They said, well, no, 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 that's not what it means now. Uh, we're going to change the, the word. Uh, it means a balance of power among in the central government, the, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary. Remember, we all we all learn this in, in, in fourth grade, et cetera. Uh, so they call themselves federalists. They called their opponents the true federalists. They called them anti-federalists. And no one likes to be called anti-something. I mean, then you're just like a negative Nancy, right? So you got you to be positive, okay? Uh, so they're already at a disadvantage. 
So you've got Federalist Robert Morris, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison versus Anti-Federalist, the governor of New York, George Clinton, no relation, uh, and the governor of Virginia, uh, Patrick Henry. Okay, so Henry, they, they, he tried to fight the adoption of the Constitution. The Federalists, they were employing all sorts of dirty tricks and, and, and bribes at the ratification uh, debates, et cetera. And Henry really tries to fight it because he realizes what he's fighting is the creation of a powerful and mighty empire. And that's what the Constitution did. The elastic clauses, the necessary and proper and the general welfare clauses, they were intended to be elastic. Okay, this is what the Constitution was intended to do. This is why the libertarians in the 1780s were fighting the Constitution, okay? Because they recognized that it would lead to, or they didn't recognize it would lead to face masks and lockdowns and stuff because, you know, they didn't have that type of foresight, but they recognized it would lead to all the policies they were trying to fight uh, Great, Great, Great Britain for imposing and uh, what the um, nationalists were trying to do during the American Revolutionary War. Unfortunately, they lose. All the states ratify the, the, uh, the Constitution. They forcibly, they force Rhode Island uh, to, to join. So you've got all 13 states in this new central government. And then, so what happens? All right, so Robert Morris, he becomes a senator of Pennsylvania. Uh, George Washington, our, our nation's first president, asked him to be uh, secretary of the treasury. And he said, no, no, no. He said, I got a man in mind though, all right? He, got a, he had his young, uh, brilliant, uh, sort of uh, associate Alexander Hamilton. He said he should be the Secretary of the Treasury, right? Uh, and so Hamilton, after James Madison lays down the nationalist infrastructure uh, as a congressman in 1789, raising uh, taxes, creating executive uh, branches, uh, filling the Supreme Court up uh, with uh, six justices, what it had at the time, Hamilton takes over in 1790, and what does he do? Well, he pushes for a funding act that will cause the government to raise money to benefit speculators, right? Which enriches Robert Morris and his group who bought the government debt at very low rates and basically got a bailout. He pushes for a stronger central bank. This is the Bank of the United States, okay? Uh, that can uh, provide various loans to business, uh, uh, favored federalist businesses uh, in the United States government. He pushes for protective tariffs. Remember, they were just trying to, trying to get a 5% tariff in the articles. Well, by the end of the 1790s, uh, you have a 30% tariff. Okay, so much higher than what the states were able to uh, enact among themselves in the 1780s uh, and much higher than what was, couldn't even be accomplished under the articles and various other policies. So all these crony policies, which privilege the North at the expense of the South and the, the West, they start to alienate a lot of people. Okay, the Constitution uh, led into all of these big government laws, all of these crony big government laws. Okay, but Hamilton doesn't stop there, right? Because if you've ever watched the play, uh, you know he does all these policies, and these are all great, and you know all sorts of other stuff. They don't really talk about the other things, kind of, uh, which is a little odd. Uh, but again, that's that, that's probably intentional. Where Hamilton more or less tried to become a military dictator. Right? And you're like, okay, so he gets his own play? He gets, he gets his own musical? You know, uh, anyway, uh, whiskey rebels, after the Federalists levy, levy a tax on the production of whiskey, people in Pennsylvania, uh, they, they, they resist. Well, we send a giant army there uh, to basically uh, intimidate them. And Hamilton basically makes himself, after he's Secretary of the Treasury, he basically makes himself the second in command of the army. Washington retired uh, from the presidency. John Adams became the Federalist president. Washington was sort of nominally in command, right? But Hamilton is really second in command, okay? And during a so-called quasi-war with France, which the Federalists were trying to turn into an actual war, Hamilton more or less kind of has uh, control of the military. And he wanted to use this military to invade uh, uh, Spanish Louisiana and South America, right? Uh, so there's a, when it, Hamilton said, when it comes to the quote, riches of Mexico and Peru, this is what he's referring to. He said, the command in this case would very naturally fall upon me. So he wanted to lead armies all over the place. Uh, this is sort of a very clear old order empire of America. Uh, but this is, this is something just totally kind of forgotten. Uh, the one 
a TV show that does actually get this is the HBO series on John Adams. They do, they do recognize this. Came out about 10 years ago. So they, they actually do, they, they, they recognize this is what Hamilton is trying to do, but if, that's, that's gone down the Orwellian memory hole. I mean, that was so 2010, right? This is, we're, we're, this is 2021, right? But anyway, um, fortunately, so what stops this? What stops the whole, the big government juggernaut, the crony juggernaut of, of, of the Federalists in the late 1790s? Well, Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists stop it. So the Anti-Federalists, they realize they lost. They can't get rid of the Constitution, all right? So like good politicians, like good strategists, they go back to the drawing board and they say, all right, wait a second. Why don't we just interpret the Constitution the way we want to do it, right? Why don't we interpret it the way the Federalists promised us? It would be a limited government document. We're going to say, well, all these clauses, they got to be strictly enumerated. Uh, if it doesn't explicitly say it, we can't, uh, we won't be able to do it. And that's really the beginning of the strict constructionist approach to the Constitution. The approach libertarians all know and love about the Constitution. It came from the opponents of the Constitution. And the Federalists recognized this uh, back then. There was one prominent Federalist and associate of Hamilton. He said, we hear incessantly from the old foes of the Constitution, this is unconstitutional and that is. He said, if the Constitution is what they affect to think it is, their former opposition to such an entity was improper which is exactly correct. <laughs> He's saying, wait, the guys who fought this are now defending it. Why are they doing that? Well, again, they're good strategists. This is what you do in politics, right? You lose, you adjust your tactics, okay? So Jefferson leads this Republican Party, which was the uh, basically the descendant uh, of, of the Anti-Federalist Party. This Republican Party has no relation uh, to the act, no institutional relation to the current Republican Party that was created in the 1850s, right? And so Jefferson defeats John Adams heroically in the Revolution of 1800. It was the first peaceful rotation of power where a political party was driven from office, okay, in the world, okay? So uh, this is a very significant event. Uh, at the end, though, the, the Federalists, they lost control of Congress. They lost control of the executive, in the waning days of uh, the Adams presidency, they do strengthen their control in the judiciary. This is the Judiciary Act of 1801. Uh, and in particular, they appoint Chief Justice, or Adams appoints Chief Justice John Marshall. Maybe some of you know him. Uh, he's the famous big government uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice. Well, you all, what you probably don't know about him is that uh, he was a prominent land speculator, and his younger brother, James Marshall, married the daughter of Robert Morris. So you can probably <laughs> sort of think like, all right, all right. So two policies is he going to support? You know, Supreme Court rulings will he will he uh, basically deliver? Okay. So unfortunately, the Republicans they get all they get two of the branches. They get two out of three ain't bad, right? At least according to Meatloaf. Uh, but uh, <laughs> hopefully some of you know that uh, reference. Um, but anyway, so the the Republicans they drive uh, the Federalists out of power, right? But unfortunately, power corrupts, okay? The Jeffersonian revolution uh, failed, okay? Because Jefferson uh, moderates. And why does he moderate? Because the Republican Party was torn between two factions. You've got the old Republicans who are the direct descendants of the Anti-Federalists, guys like John Randolph and John Taylor. So John Randolph of Roanoke. John Taylor of Caroline. These are both uh, famous Virginia politicians. John Randolph was uh, related to Jefferson. They wanted to bring the government back to the Articles of Confederation. So get rid of the Bank of the United States, get rid of tariffs, possibly even repudiate the debt, uh, reduce the army, all of these drastic cuts. Okay, they had big, they had big visions, right? On the other hand, there were the moderates particularly James Madison, who is an ex-Federalist who sort of opportunistically allied with Thomas Jefferson. He said, well, as long as the right people are in power, then you know, we can control the cronyism for, for our own ends, so to speak. And Jefferson is sort of torn in the middle, right? He wants to bring in all of the ex-Federal, all of the Federalists, excuse me, into the Republican Party, right? This was, he was a great libertarian uh, theoretician, but he was kind of a bad politician. And they do, the first administration of Thomas Jefferson actually gets some stuff done. They repeal uh, various taxes. They start to reduce the military. They don't get rid of the Bank of the United States, but they, they, they move to privatizing it, right? Uh, it, it gets an A in my book, but it wasn't as, 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 as much as, as what the, the, the radicals wanted, okay? It was a disappointment. 
The problem is in the second term of Thomas Jefferson, right, where then you start to see an outright increase in cronyism. Okay, the second term of Thomas, Thomas Jefferson gets, you know, just gets an F, right? You got, you got an A in your first semester, and then you got an F in your second semester, right? So it's it really kind of a, a cast a, a, a dark shadow over the Jeffersonian presidency. And the, the reason why the Jeffersonian presidency was such a disaster was because of the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. So when I'm referring to Louisiana, I'm not referring to just the state. All right, that we know by New Orleans. All right, back then it referred to this massive swath of land uh, west of the Mississippi River. Kind of bounced around control of various powers. In the early 1800s, Spain had sold it to France. Uh, uh, France sort of reneged on its agreement for various reasons I talk about. And then France uh, sold it to the United States. And the issue was in order for the United States to buy all that land, it kind of had to, the, the Republicans had to bend their strict construction of the Constitution, which is what Jefferson realized. He first wanted to pass an amendment allowing the United States government to purchase the land, and then he dropped it. And the problem with land is that once you, want, once you get some, you want more, right? Because the Republicans moved to trying to get Florida. They moved to try to get Canada, right? They pushed for internal improvements, roads and canals to bind the East with the West, Okay. Jefferson tries to uh, uh, curry up support with manufacturers in the North to sort of strengthen this empire. And this is why John Randolph called the Louisiana Purchase. He said it was, quote, the greatest curse that ever befell us, right? Because it really was, because it totally sabotaged the Republicans' uh, policy of strict constructionism. Okay. And uh, in particular, as I mentioned, the Republicans moved to try to get Canada in the North in Florida in the South, okay? And this is the aggression that leads up to the War of 1812 during the uh, James Madison administration, okay? Whereas when you really see the Republicans basically become the, uh, the former Federalists, this is the total corruption of power. So cronyism increased in the 1790s, then it declined a bit in the first part of Jefferson's term, then it started to increase again. This is the jagged nature of uh, cronyism that I mentioned uh, in, my, uh, in my thesis, right? So Madison maneuvers to try and get Canada in the North, right? Uh, and Florida in the South. And though they failed in the War of 1812, which is when we declared war on Great Britain, uh, it led to all sorts of new forms of cronyism. Uh, we increased the debt, which benefited uh, various speculators. We, we created, we chartered a new second bank of the United States and new protectionist tariffs, okay? This all happened in, after the war, after the war's uh, end in uh, 1815 and in 1816. Uh, John Randolph, he tried to fight this post-war cronyism, and I just, I just love this quote. He says, all of this stuff is out, out Hamilton's Alexander Hamilton. Right, which means it must have been really bad, right? If it's, if it's worse than Hamilton, right? A, a central bank beyond Hamilton's dreams, protective tariffs beyond Hamilton's dreams, internal improvements beyond Hamilton's dreams. This is, this is clearly a lot of cronyism. So Han uh, Randolph is a congressman. He tries to fight this, uh, but he unfortunately uh, fails, okay? So this brings us to the period after the Jeffersonian Revolution, okay? The so-called era of good feelings but what one historian, Robert Romini, has more accurately described, uh, uh, labeled in my opinion, is the era of corruption. And this was a one-party system where basically the Republican Party, which is now pro-big government, they call themselves the National Republicans now, pursued all sorts of crony policies. Right? These were all under the label of uh, Henry Clay's American system. You might've heard this before, which is we're gonna have a strong central bank that will promote economic development, AKA it will grant loans to favored businesses. We're gonna have a protective tariff that will in, uh, promote national defense and an American industry, AKA it's going to promote uh, Northern uh, manufacturers at the expense of the rest of the country. And we're gonna use the revenue from the American tariff uh, from our new protective tariff to create internal improvements to bind the country together, okay, aka to reduce decentralization and to privilege transportation companies that are building uh, these uh, roads and canals. So unfortunately, though, uh, the Panic of 1819 hits, right, 
where the second bank of the United States engages in a tremendous amount of credit expansion. And as good Austrians, we know this leads to an Austrian business cycle. The bank massively inflated. And then in 1818, uh, it started to sharply contract. The bank was saved, but the people were ruined, as uh, one famous uh, uh, his, uh, uh, commentator uh, said. In this panic of 1819, more importantly, it radical, you know, it, it increases the, the radicalism of various uh, American politicians, brings them back to their anti-crony roots, right? You got guys like Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, Thomas Hart Benton, and James K. Polk. They all started to realize that the Bank of the United States was this enormous problem. Hard money was the solution, and the American system was only going to increase the government's uh, ills, Okay. On the other hand, they fought uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John Quincy Adams, right? these prominent politicians. You got Nicholas Biddle, who's the head of the Second Bank of the United States, and of course, John Marshall. I don't think it's a coincidence that all these later individuals, Clay, Webster, Adams, Biddle, and Marshall, they all worked for the Second Bank of the United States and owned stock in it. Uh, yes, John Marshall, Chief Justice, right before the famous McCulloch versus um, Mar uh, um, McCulloch versus Maryland, uh, which defended the constitutionality of the bank. He, he sold his stock right before, which kind of, you know, you see the smoking gun. Uh, Jackson was, was very against the second bank. He was very against its attendant evils and corruption. Right? Can, can, you, can we go back to the days when politicians would call central banks, the central banking activities evil and corrupt? You know, it's, it's, just, it's just more fiery language. It's, it's good. Uh, you know, now we just hear about monetary policy and all this. You know, this is, this is much more interesting, right? Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, the proponents of the American system, the national Republicans, they uh, try to raise tariffs, okay? Raise tariffs beyond the levels of 1816. This was the tariff of 1824. Uh, in promoting this tariff of 1824, Clay uh, sort of harken back. He 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 advocated. We need to go. We need to listen to the quote master spirit of the age, the man who knew how to build an empire, Napoleon Bonaparte. So Na Napoleon knew how to build an empire, and so did Clay. Okay. Then you have the tariff of 1828, which led one prominent New England manufacturer uh, to say it would keep the South and the West in debt to New England the next hundred years. Okay, this raised tariffs about like 50%, like extremely high rate, like 5% articles, 50% constitution, you know, under the constitution. Again, uh, this, this really upset um, many individuals. Uh, they also had passed the General Survey Act of 1824 to at least start to uh, envision the program for all of these internal improvements that would bind the country together. Okay, so slowly the American system uh, is getting uh, uh, pushed, all right? It's getting enacted, okay? They're also promoting the American empire, right? We get Florida under the stewardship of Secretary of State John Quincy Adams, right? And in doing so, we assume the losses of various New England merchants, right, which historians have considered a uh, marked unprecedented American underwriting of private commercial losses. We try to get Cuba, okay? And this was because the National Republicans wanted South America to have the same position as North America did in relationship to Great Britain, right? We would manufacture everything for the Western Hemisphere, and they would just supply us raw materials. So we tried to maneuver to conquer uh, parts of South America or get them uh, to enact favorable trade legislation with us that gave us deals but hurt um, uh, other countries, okay, so not free trade. So all of these policies were being created. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, fortunately, we had another revolution, right? We had the Jacksonian Revolution, okay? So uh, Jackson actually really kind of won the presidency in 1824. He had the plurality of the popular vote uh, in the Electoral College, but uh, John Quincy Adams and Henry Clay, they scheme uh, to provide Adams the presidency, all right, uh, in return for Clay getting the presidency in the future. So this is the corrupt bargain of 1825, right? And Jackson fumes at this. He says, the Judas of the West, Clay, has closed the contract and received the 30 pieces of silver. His end will be the same, okay? 
Uh, so he, he, he was not, uh, he was not happy. And if you make Jackson, if, if, if Jackson doesn't like you, 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 there, there are going to be some issues, uh, for you in the future. So this led to Jackson and his associate Senator, uh, from New York, Martin Van Buren to organize a new party, uh, a, to try to recreate the old, uh, Republican faction. So re- bring the Republican party back to its roots. They created the democratic party, which is actually the same democratic party of today. Might shock you, but the Democrat, Democratic Party was conceived to be a was conceived in liberty. I guess uh, it was it was it was a it was a libertarian uh, party. And, ja- and Van Buren said, if General Jackson and his friends will put his election on old party grounds, right, AKA crony, anti-cronyism, our success when achieved will be worth something. And they successfully create this new Democratic Party and deprive John Quincy Adams of his reelection bid. So now the Jack- Jacksonians take over Andrew Jackson's president. And surprisingly, the Jacksonians actually uh, get more stuff done than the Jeffersonians. Okay, so this is where uh, I then move into the uh, Jacksonian Revolution, which unfortunately was still failed, a uh, failure for reasons I'll talk about. The Jacksonians uh, got more stuff done. They were more tenacious, right? They revolutionize the presidential veto, where they just started vetoing stuff, the president, um, uh, instead of sort of rubber stamping Congress's legislation. And they could work with various British reformers who were also trying to remove crony privileges in their country. So the first thing, one of the first things Jackson does is he starts attacking the central, the second bank of the United States, uh, and he vetoes its early recharter. Okay, so he says, no, we're not going to uh, support the Second Bank of the United States. We're going to try and get rid of the American system. And Jackson considered it a, a, a hydra, all right, which led to this political cartoon uh, where you see this, this, this nasty hydra and Jackson fighting it. It was actually sort of lampooning Jackson's attack. But I don't know, I just like this because, again, it's a, the central bank is portrayed as this, this, this evil hydra. It's this monster, it's this menace, which you'd say, yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. I, I, I agree with it. Yeah, that works well, All right? So they get rid of the Second Bank of the United States and they start to uh, you know, uh, pursue, uh, pursue monetary reform at the state level. They also dismantle tariffs, All right? Uh, they lower tariffs progressively over, the, uh, over 10, 15 years, culminating in the free trade Walker Tariff of 1846, Right, which uh, lowered tariffs uh, significantly and uh, coincided with the British repeal of the Corn Laws okay, in 1846, which led the Cincinnati Inquirer to say the simultaneous triumph of free trade in the United States and Great Britain is the greatest event of our age. Okay, so think about that. Right? It's the greatest event. We, we, got, we got relative free trade. Uh, possible only through these these countries sort of informally working together to remove their respective crony privileges. Uh, And Jackson also uh, reduces internal improvements in government spending. He vetoes the Maysville uh, Road Bill. He pays off the national debt. Uh, One of his uh, Jacksonian presidential successors, James K. Polk, vetoes the River and Harbors Bill. You see on the state level, various general and corporation laws uh, deregulating uh, business formation uh, at the uh, in the local arena. So all of this great stuff, right? So you say, well, this is great. Got rid of the bank, got rid of tariffs, got rid of the debt, got rid of internal improvements. What's the problem? The problem is, unfortunately, the Jacksonians, uh, they did not get rid of the imperialist plank, okay? And this split the Jacksonian party because some of them wanted to get rid of it. The, 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 the big issue was Texas annexation, okay? Texas was a separate country at the time, and there was a big movement to annex Texas uh, in the 1840s. This would benefit various speculators who held uh, Texas debt, such as Nicholas Biddle, uh, the former head of the Second Bank of the United States, various land speculators, as well as slave interests, right, who recognized uh, slaves were escaping uh, to, uh, to, to Texas uh, or to Mexico, okay? Van Buren and Benton, uh, they split with Jackson and Polk on this issue uh, over Texas. Uh, Jackson and Polk said, uh, we want to annex Texas. Van Buren and Benton said, no, we don't want to. And this led to what Rothbard uh, is described as a tragic split in the Democratic Party. Right? It sort of cost the organization its libertarian conscience and drive. 
And this led to the war uh, with Mexico, which is really just a war of conquest to try and take over the Southwest, particularly uh, California. Uh, so we could get ports on the West Coast. So then we could then start to uh, extend our imperialism to China. Okay. So this totally ruined the Democratic Party. Okay, it turned it into a big government party, and this all happened rapidly in the 1840s. So similar to the Jeffersonians, their empire of liberty became an empire of power. Cronyism declined, then it started to increase again. Okay, so by the end, by 1850, uh, we had no more significant libertarian uh, political party uh, in the country. So in conclusion, uh, cronyism will be great, although I can't promise anything. Uh, you should buy the book when it comes out in October. Uh, it's a perfect for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and Valentine's Day uh, <laughs> gifts. So anyway, I encourage you uh, to buy it. Uh, thank you so much for listening to my talk. <laughs>